Welcome everybody at day four at SHA 2017. Um, our next speaker is Vesna, and she will be uh, giving a lecture in ethics in technology. Enjoy your talk. Hi everyone, I'm very happy to be at SHA 2017 because at this occasion, I'm celebrating 20 years anniversary that I am attending Dutch hacker camps. <laughs> so it's not too far away from the first place, which was at HIP 97 in Almere Baute. So here I am back again in the polder. Why this talk about ethics in technology? Well, I've been uh, very happy to be part of the, uh, the modern science advancement and the engineering and the uh, beauty that was the internet for 25 years. I've been a techno-optimist and I believed that the science and engineering and the internet are going to make the world a better place. And that corresponds with this white space in the yin and yang symbol. So it's the, the symbolism for the positive energy, for the expansion, for the growth, for all the good things. And then about five years ago, I actually turned to the dark side and started being techno-pessimist, and now I'm actually dreading the fact that by being a technologist and trying to build the internet, I'm actually helping to destroy the world. And that's really scary, and then I was thinking, well, what can I do about it? And then I started exploring this gray area, which is ethics, the values the reasons why we do things, the reasons why we believe that something is good or bad. And that's somehow connected with my passions, things that I care about in daily life, but it's also connected with my work. So luckily, I, I can combine these things because I work for IPNCC and I'm a community builder there. And so I came from this engineering background and went towards the outreach, giving lectures. And what I'm not is an expert in uh, philosophy of ethics. So it's just something that I'm passionate about, and this is where the, the hacking comes into the picture. So I'm kind of hacking the uh, uh, philosophy of ethics in, in our own way. Uh, a little bit about logistics. This talk looks like it's actually consisting of three parts, but it's actually three talks crammed into one talk slot. So I'll be talking very quickly, I'll be skipping a lot of slides, and um, I might not even finish by the end of the hour. So uh, I actually booked another hour for the discussion in the Cha village next door. So if there is no time for the questions after this, we can move there afterwards. And uh, since I'm celebrating, there will be probes. These are the references that I will be using throughout the slides, so please read them, because I cannot cram all of that in one hour. So let's start. The science and technology and then ethics. So what is ethics? Well, Wikipedia definition is here. So it's a philosophical study of uh, uh, looking into our values. So some people call it morality, some people call it ethics, and then there is like a lot to study about that. And the people from the beginnings of the uh, Western um, philosophy have been studying this a lot. So as, as hackers, we sometimes tend to think that only the engineering is science, so only like natural science is a science. This is also science, and we need to put some effort into incorporating all the learnings that have happened over the centuries to start with, but also over the millennia since we were humans into uh, 
thinking how do these values apply to this very, very modern technological field, very narrow field that we are dealing uh, with here at, uh, at the Hackers Conference. So uh, here is the handy pie chart that uh, splits all the uh, sciences into different disciplines, which is great for going very deep into ethics of each one of these disciplines. But the problem with that is that it also actually creates this silo mentality where you cannot easily get the interdisciplinarity between the philosophy and engineering. And that's what the, this talk is trying to merge. And this is what I'm trying to actually invite you to uh, incorporate in your practices, trying to be interdisciplinary between things that are maybe not exactly your area of expertise. So, since the classical sciences started developing, well, uh, recently, there were a lot of moral dilemmas. For example, with uh, the development of nuclear energy and the threat of the, the nuclear destruction, of the whole earth. Uh, in the medical sciences, we had, uh, had to come up with the oath of Hippocrates, which then has to be applied on dealing with uh, people and also on the medical research. So there is a lot of ethical questions there. And then uh, similarly, with the development of the chemistry, we had to look into the ethical um, consequences of using these chemical products that are beneficial for certain tasks, but are actually destroying and, and the rest of the, uh, let's say, life or biosphere and leading to extinctions of certain species. So the Silent Spring from uh, Rachel Carson was started in the 60s, this movement in the environmental sciences and ethics. So this is only there to kind of give you the background reading if you download the slides, because I will take this as a given. Technical is political. As well as the programming is political, languages are political, artifacts have politics, the translations are political, crypto is political, coding is political, personal is political, everything is political. But that's not my talk, so I'll just move on. So again, uh, uh, the, in the more recent and a bit more focused on, on this crowd history, we had a lot of ethical dilemmas with using computer science for the things that were maybe not intended to, like counting the victims of the Holocaust, or what is the artificial intelligence going to do with, when we embed our ethical biases, unconscious biases, into programming artificial intelligence. And then we had, of course, cryptography, then we have the privacy in the networking, and all these things that are, of course, covered by other people uh, in the talk, so I'll skip this, and come to the internet, and the free software, and hacking. So the, the problem with, with the realizing how powerful the ethics and values that we have are in building the internet is so many. <laughs> so I, I will just point to some of them. When the internet was developed, it was developed by geeks and academics and engineers and military. And it wasn't meant to take, uh, let's say, take such a large role that it has in the society today. So the initial people who actually developed the internet, because it didn't just appear, it was actually developed by people, those people had certain ethical values, and they have built it into the foundations of the internet, and now we have to deal with the consequences of that. So we discussed all kinds of things there, like uh, biases, discrimination, sexism, whatever, and um, the, the, the other uh, important thing there is that there, uh, a lot of these people used to feel like being on the margins of the society. Oh, they're, they're just engineers, or they're just geeks, or they're just hackers. And even themselves, they were feeling discriminated against. 
And now, we, who were these geeks and nerds and engineers and hackers, we are not anymore on the margins of the society. We are building this core network, this internet, which is used for everything. It's used for health, it's used for banking and for transport and for the social media. And it's a lot of responsibility for ourselves to bear, but we have to take that responsibility. The similar thing with free software. So it was a really nice idea. The ethics of free software are beautiful. And these quotes come from a book of a friend of mine, which I want to promote. So here is the link. And then after the free software, or Libre software, came the open source. And already there, in such a small part of our small community, there is already the ethical values that are, that are clashing with each other. And they are unexamined. Because we, as engineers, as hackers, we don't really want to think about that, and we are not even trained to think about that. But we need to learn it. Because since recently, everybody needs a hacker. And we also have hackers' ethics. So this is a mandatory slide. So talking about ethics and, and technology and the hackers' conference, we have to have hackers' ethic as it is listed here. But in one of these references that I already showed, there is a link to a talk by Alison who actually questioned all of this. So we will come back to this and see how can we question even such a great thing as hackers' ethics. The similar things about crypto. So there was this guy who, after Snowden, said, wait a minute, what is the crypto community doing? What is the, the brain cycles of all these brilliant people? What are they used for? And how can we put them to better use? So if you are from the crypto community, this is a checklist of the questions that you can ask yourself and, and try to live up to your own personal ethics by examining it and making conscious decisions about what is your work being used for. Another example, critical engineering, another great reference, another great website when we talk about ethics. So now we come to some even more applied ethics, and that is going towards uh, the, the work uh, function that I do, and that is about internet measurements. So there, there was a group of people who came up together, like really made an interdisciplinary team, and, and started from the theory of the applied ethics. And this is the most difficult slide for me because like, I read so many times their paper and it's really hard for me to, to deal with this. So there are all kinds of types of ethics. So consequentialism. So the things are good if they're put to good use, utilitarianism. So if we make, make a program or an app that is actually going to be uh, used for some good things, then the rest doesn't matter. How it was developed, what can it be abused for, none of that matters because some of the uses that it was made for were good. So that's utilitarianism. Then there is like consequences, of the acts and consequences of the rules. Like, yeah, we meant it to be used this way, and if it would have been used only that way, it would have had good consequences, but the people who choose to use it for something else, then they have to stop behaving in the unethical way, and that is one way of looking at the ethics in this consequentialism way. Then there is deontology, which now I don't, I don't exactly know what it is, so I'll just skip it. And then the virtue ethics, like if you are a good person, then the things that you develop will end up being good things. So you just make sure that you're a good person, and it doesn't matter if you work for a bad company, because you're a good person. And so that's how some people explain their ethical position. But I'm a good person, it cannot be that my products are going to be used for bad things. Then there is principalism, so that's already becoming a bit more practical, like, okay, so how, if we want to make sure 
that our products or our measurements are being used in an ethical way, which rules do we have to follow, which principles do we have to embed in our measurement to make it as ethical as possible. So these are the rules. You need to respect autonomy of the participants in that measurement. You need to have their beneficiaries in mind. You should try not to hurt anyone and that it should be fair and just. So already, if you embed only these principles, it's already better than just thinking, oh, nothing can go wrong because I'm doing it for the good reason. And finally, the best would be to combine a lot of these because it cannot uh, uh, be pre prescribed like one set of rules for any internet measurement or any software project. So you need to look into the pluralism of causes, pluralism of uh, ethical principles, and try to combine them. So again, from that paper, if, you take, if you're interested only in internet measurements and you take anything back home, this is the summary. So they are saying that the internet is not anymore just a technical network. It's actually a socio-technical system and we have to consider it as such. Uh, the, the power imbalances that exist in building the internet, controlling the internet, and the users of the internet also have to be taken into consideration. And when involving these users into internet measurements, a lot of effort has to be put into obtaining their informed consent. And that's hard for many, many reasons, because people will just click, I agree, you can write anything in there. It's very difficult to, so that's one reason. The other one is it's very difficult to simplify the explanation of what is it that you're actually doing and what the consequences can be for them to make the meaningful informed consent. And so on. So there are all kinds of challenges, but this is the effort that has to be put in the measurements and then any other technological development before you even start. Then again, weighing all the risks and benefits uh, before you start. Uh, the next thing is if you're just using somebody else's data or it's all there in public anyway. It's easily accessible, but it was maybe not meant to be that, uh, used that way. So you have to still go through all these uh, checks and ask yourself, doesn't matter if it was easily accessible and you didn't put it in there, are you using it in the ethical way? And not agreeing with somebody else who is doing unethical measurements. So there were conferences which actually refused some papers which were based on the unethical measurement principles because they would put the users in danger and they, the, the conference organizers didn't want to accept such a paper. Although the findings were quite interesting, but the methods to which those results were obtained were not actually ethical. And another flowchart from, uh, from that paper, this is how you actually go around designing such a thing. Now that's all very theoretical, and now we move to the actual practical thing. So I will give a very short introduction about what is RIPE NCC, what is RIPE Atlas, and then how did we implement all these ethical principles uh, in RIPE Atlas. But before that, how many of you already know what RIPE NCC is? A half. How many of you know what RIPE Atlas is? Which is probably the same group. <laughs> okay, so very, very short introduction. RIPE NCC stands for Réseau IP European. Pardon my French. European IP Networks. And then uh, RIPE NCC, Network Coordination Center. Now, a lot of people say all the time, RIPE for short, when they mean RIPE NCC, but it's two completely different things. RIPE is a community of operators in Europe and all these other mustard colored areas, which came together in uh, 89 to develop principles for governing IP resources and by that also other aspects of developing internet in Europe and those areas. And so they get together on these kinds of cons conferences, although not on the camping grounds. 
and uh, they talk to each other and come up with these common rules, uh, like to how to deal with the internet. And the similar thing happens in other regions. Now, all these five organizations that are listed there, not IANA, but the other four regional internet registries are like RIPE NCC. So there is a community which is RIPE, and then there is a company, RIPE NCC, that gives out IP addresses, to, to keep it simple. These are the IPv6 addresses that we give out. So we get a large block from IANA, so it's very hierarchical. Uh, IANA, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority gives addresses to regional internet registry. They give them to local internet registry, which is normally an ISP or a hosting provider, sometimes a bank, sometimes whatever, some other organization wants to be independent. And then they, in case of internet providers, they use them for their end user network. And so these blocks are distributed that way. It used to be the same process for the IPv4, but we ran out of IPv4. So we are now mostly talking about IPv6. And that's the end of the introduction about RIPE NCC. Now, that was the core uh, job of the NCC. And what else we do is developing this global distributed internet measurement platform called RIPE Atlas. We do that because all those members of the RIPE NCC, because it's, it's an association of members, they all um, pay yearly fee to the RIPE NCC. And since NCC is not for profit organization, we, we can't really spend all that money. And so we invest it into other projects, such as this distributed measurement project, because we are this central organization that is trusted by its members, then they trust us to collect the data generated by these measurement devices. So the device itself, current version, is a modified TP-Link router. So it's not a router anymore. We have installed Open, OpenWRT on it, and uh, you plug it in to your internet connection in the office or at home, and you plug it into electricity and it starts doing ping, traceroute, and DNS lookup to root name servers. So DNS infrastructure, critical internet infrastructure. So there is about 10,000 of these things hosted by volunteers, people like you. And all of these devices generate these very baseline measurements, like very low protocol stack measurements, and we collect the data and then release the data back to the community. We also create some visualizations of it, a lot of tools, and so on. So it's a great measurement network, also operated by the community, but uh, actually and the infrastructure is operated by RIPE NCC. And there are a lot of features that I will not talk about, and then there are there are other measurement platforms that we both cooperate with and can be compared with. So in 2014, somebody actually looked into all these measurement platforms. How can they be used for looking into the interference? So detecting if somebody is messing up with a network somewhere globally, either for the censorship, or mostly for the censorship, or just to shut down the whole internet. So the two use cases in this paper that were described were the shutting down of the internet in Turkey, or rather redirecting the, the DNS servers in Turkey. Uh, and uh, what was the other one? It will come to me later. So, there are other measurement networks, and for this talk, it is uh, most important for me to see how, how the ethical principles applied for the rest of them and how they're uh, applied for the, for the RIPE Atlas. So that is also described in this paper if you want more details. So when we were developing RIPE Atlas, which was like six years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, we made some decisions, conscious decisions, that made this network 
useful for certain things and actually completely unusable for other types of measurements. Although people asked us, although there is a need for such a thing, we decided not to go there. And th that was for the ethical reasons. So, um, what we do is only active measurements. So we only generate pings and trace routes and DNS lookups. Um, we don't listen to the existing traffic. So on one hand, this is good because we protect the users from themselves, like we don't listen to their traffic, but to the, on the other hand, we cannot measure the bandwidth speed because not directly, not of your connection. Then uh, we also decided to have all the tools open source and in some cases also free software. Uh, API calls are also open and the data is completely available and open. We published methodology on what is it that we measure so that other researchers can actually compare results with, with our analysis results. And we limit the set of measurements so that we don't put the users in danger. So a lot of people want to measure the web, tra web traffic because for the newer generation of internet users, the web is the internet. But we just don't do that. We don't actually do HTTP measurements because that would put in danger people in the countries where there is a blockage of the web content. And so if you are trying to fetch a forbidden web page, then you can get in trouble. Now, something that I maybe didn't make clear is, let me go back to, to this picture. So the thing is, when you install this thing in your house in, let's say, Holland, the probe itself is not really useful to you. It is useful for other people who want to measure how is the internet performance towards certain server in another part of the globe uh, performing from Holland. And, and you get access to all the probes around the globe hosted by other people. So basically, the, the uh, building up principle was that uh, that of trust. So I put this thing in my network, I have to trust both RIPE NCC, but all, also I have to trust 10,000 users around the globe that are going to do ping from my probe to a server in Brazil, to a server in Saudi Arabia, to a server in Africa, to a server in wherever. And so if they do a ping, it's less problematic than if they try to fetch a web page from my home IP address in a country where, like, if that web page like, is Pirate Bay in Holland, well, then I might get in trouble. But if I ping Pirate Bay, okay, that's a bit less problematic. So this is one of the reasons why we have kept the set of measurements to a very limited set. And here is the mandatory photo of a cat. And this is uh, somebody's uh, probe in somebody's house, so we don't want to put that person nor this cat in any danger by doing the measurements, which are really geeky and really useful for all of us who want to know how internet performs, but it can put the real people and the real cats in real life problems. So that was many years ago when we were designing concept of a network, what are we going to do? And since then, um, well, since I was a community builder, people kept asking me, like, wait a minute, but why is no, where is your source code? And I was like, oh, oh, yeah, we are working on it. So in 2013, we actually published the source code. So now you can examine what, what it does. Then, um, in 2014, we, we thought, okay, this is, uh, uh, we would like to propose that all the measurements that are performed should be made public. And then some of the users from the community said, no, we actually see the value of keeping some of my measurements not public, or at least not at the same, like at real time. So we kind of asked the users and they insisted, so we decided to, to, to allow some of them to be non-public. The, differences between the values of openness, so having open data, like you are paying for it and you should have all the open data, and the other value is privacy, or even in this case it wasn't even privacy, but it was more like 
troubleshooting value. So if, my, if I'm using Drive Atlas to troubleshoot some problems in my network, I don't want that measurement to immediately become publicly visible to everybody else. But of course, it is published anyway in the aggregated data. So the value of openness is still satisfied. And some people who value privacy, they also got their say. Then in 2015, we actually did implement HTTP measurements, but they are not available for random websites. So the user cannot actually schedule them, but we do them towards some servers that we operate, which are called RIPE Atlas anchors. And in 2016, we hired one of the security companies to do a third-party security audit to make sure that there aren't actually any exploits that we didn't think of or any problems, security problems, which lead to ethical consequences. And so we published the results of that security audit. And then this year, we went to the RightsCon in uh, Brussels, which was actually quite an eye-opener for me. There were a lot of people, a lot of advocates of defending human rights using the internet tools. And one of those internet tools is internet measurements. And so how can we use the internet measurement networks to at least publicize the human rights violations in certain countries where internet shutdown is somewhat considered an, an human right violation if it is done for certain purposes of oppression. And so the, the people who were there, they uh, made this survey and they compared a lot of existing measurement tools uh, according to certain criteria. And then they also examined RIPE Atlas and they, they found out that indeed it does ensure large scale access so a lot of measurements are possible. However, and again, I said, like, we don't measure web traffic. And then it does satisfy some of the requirements. So they have their own checklist. And the RIPE Atlas actually fits with some of their requirements, but then, again, not with, with all of them. So we also are very friendly with the hackers. And so when, when uh, we started distributing these probes to hackerspaces, then they, of course, opened them and hacked them and examined them. They were like, oh, really? That's what you say it does? Well, let me check. So they did. They checked it. And then they reported it, luckily, first back to us. So we have this responsible disclosure procedure available to, the, to everyone. And so if you report it to us, we will try to fix it first and then publish it anyway. And then thank you for making us aware of this uh, security flaw. And there is uh, more probes at hackerspaces and at hacker camps. And there will be a talk tomorrow about the measurements between hackerspaces. Uh, that, that are done uh, with the RIPE Atlas probes. It's called Hackerspaces Jedi. We also do hackathons. They're a lot of fun. We support academics to come to the RIPE community. And we also have this publishing platform called RIPE Labs. I'm going very quickly through the slides because there's many slides left. So at the end of this talk about the, the RIPE Atlas and the RIPE NCC, this is my invitation to you to join and to take part in one way or the other. So if you are a coder or a designer or a developer or researcher, you can join our hackathons. The next one is in November in Copenhagen. The topic is IPv6. It's our sixth hackathon. Then we have a lot of meetings where you can come and meet your colleagues from these communities and exchange your experiences with them. You can join the RIPE Atlas community by hosting a probe. So after this talk, we can go to CHA, and you can get one of these probes, or you can just use the data. So again, to, to make it even more clear, uh, the data from these probes is not available only to the probe hosts. It is available both to the probe hosts and to anybody. So it's genuinely open. Uh, you do need to have an account to download the data. There are APIs. You can download things. There is a web interface. But the data is open. So 
we are also interested in cooperation with other organizations that are interested in using our data. How can we make it easily accessible? What do you find in the data that we also like to learn from? And once you do that, then we're going to publish it also on uh, labs.tribe.net. And we also publish our software. It's on GitHub, especially from the hackathons. Please use it and improve it and give it back to the community. So these are the contact details where you can find me. Oh, okay, I'll take some water. So now the, the next uh, part of my talk starts. How do we go beyond the hacker's ethics? So how do we, how do we question the assumptions that we have about the hacker's ethics beings, about openness, about meritocracy, about sharing, about tolerance, about improving the world. Well, one of the assumptions is how does the hacker look like? And so it's kind of gray on gray, but mostly if you, if you do a search for the image of a hacker and you go to images, it's a guy in a hoodie. And then if you can see his face, it's mostly a white guy in a hoodie. And so there is this woman who made a very simple website where you can actually choose all these characteristics and make other images of the hacker just to familiarize yourself with the fact that the hackers actually come in all kinds of shapes and forms and t-shirts and dresses, hairs, colors, drink, also other things and not only club mate. So this is one of the, one of the assumptions uh, about the hackers community that if an outsider comes to this community, they will be pretty much reassured about the typical view of the hackers are. So this is one of the other separate goals that I have in life, is to change this situation and increase diversities of the hackers' communities. And then I want to plug in the, the, the paper of the Alison Parrish, or her presentation, which is called Programming is Forgetting. So she describes in, the, in that presentation that where, whenever we create a view of a reality, we have to discard most of the input that we have in order to create a certain view. And the way in which we choose what we keep to create our picture of reality is our ethics, is our values, is actually embodying our ethics and our values. And then she goes on to kind of de dissect the hacker's ethics. And then instead of coming up with a new set of hacker ethics, she comes up with questions. How can we question the classical hacker's ethics? And here, here are some of them. So access to computers should be unlimited and total. To whom? Who gets to use the computers? Who gets to make the computers? Who is actually making all the equipment that uh, we, are, um, we are all using? Who is being left out? How is the software that you are making hindering or helping the access to the computers that should be free? The same for the data. All information should be free. Well, to whom? Who is using it? And so on. So there's a lot of questions there. And in the, in the original quote, it also says that hackers should be judged by their hacking and not by any other criteria. And the gender was not even there. So it also says that the, the hackers can be from a different uh, background, different educational background, without degrees, without technical background, of a different age, of a different race, in a different position in life. Mothers can also be hackers. Mothers are hackers. So these are all the questions that we have to ask ourselves every time, even if we are hackers and we think we are the good guys 
or we are the good girls. More questions. From the paper of the uh, ethics in the network system research, which you can access on this website, these are all kinds of questions that you have to ask yourself before you start measuring things on the internet. And then, this is to say, do not be just utilitarian. Like, if, is this app a good thing? Because it actually achieves a useful purpose? How does it do that? Okay, that's a good question, but it's just one of the possible questions. Why did there even come uh, an idea that this app should be in place? Who is going to use it? Who is going to be helped by that? Who is go be going to be harmed by that? So, question, everything. And then question even more things. <laughs> so, what other kinds of internets can we imagine? One of the possible internets is a feminist internet. So, several years ago, uh, a group of people came together and they came up with the principles for the feminist internet. So, it's at least a good reading material because we are not going to undo the current internet, but embedding these values within yourself or even realizing that they exist is a good uh, starting point. One of my favorites is changing the way we communicate. And that can be done using principles of non-violent communication or empathic listening, empathic leadership, and being open to recognize your feelings and realizing that there is space in the open source and in the free software development for humans, for, for our emotions, for our needs, and that is also very much connected with our values and with our ethics. So the so-called NVC, the Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, is, in my opinion, very suitable for the programmer's types because it's quite algorithmical. It gives you steps and th there, are, there are loops where you can get stuck for a while, but then you return with a, with a variable that gets another value into your algorithm and then you proceed from there. So, give it a try if you're curious about learning another way to communicate. And then, going to step beyond that is even more empathic build-up of the internet. And uh, I recommend this book called To Our Friends by the Invisible Committee. They are an anarchist collective that a few years ago gave a talk at the CCC Congress. And so they are uh, talking about redefining what freedom means and moving away from feelings of individual freedom to the freedom of forming collectives and the, the freedom to create connections with others. And even further, there is anarchism, there is green anarchy, there is Buddhism and the principles of Burning Man and principles of permaculture and the ethics of polyamory. So these are the things that we can bring into the hackers community to make our community more resilient, better and helpful for the rest of the world, not only for ourselves. How much time? Okay. So to go beyond techno-optimism, I have to dive deeper into the techno-pessimism first and to point out uh, something that you all know about mobile phones being uh, surveillance devices. And this was actually predicted in the 1982 in the paper, Do Artifacts Have Politics? And so, at that time, he thought that, oh, um, if you ask people to wear a surveillance device, they're not going to do it. But if you 
just market it differently. If you say, oh, it's a cool technological um, innovation, then they will, they will go for it. Well, he said it better. So, <laughs> um, if somebody would propose that as a political statement, people would revolt. But since it wasn't political, it was made apolitical to have a mobile phone and to examine what do the mobile phones can be used for, people actually uh, accepted the, the surveillance that comes with the cool gadget. So the other problems that uh, exist with the current technology, technological level of, of uh, development are the, the energy use, the violence that has to be uh, used for extracting the resources from nature, the violence that has to be used against the people who make those devices, and pollution of the environment. So these are all the things that are also part of building the internet. And then there is even more political statement about the hierarchy and the capitalistic way of how the internet is built. And then there is a digital divide. So while for some people we get these blue, cool data center spaces where all of, all of our data is, is stored and processed, for other people we get pollution and again the violence and the extraction of, of their homes. But there is hope. The squirrels are fighting back. So this is, uh, this is actually what happened on uh, Ohm four years ago. There was a lot of damage to the infrastructure from rodents. And uh, for most of the people who actually maintain the networks, that was a problem. But for me, that was actually a good thing. Like, yeah, yeah, now we have to also count on them. Is this internet actually a good thing for the squirrels? Why are we only talking about us and humans in the other areas of the world, how about the squirrels? And we have to count on them in more ways than one, because actually they are winning the cyber war. The, the squirrels are apparently the number one cause of most of the internet disruptions, at least in US, and a lot of power outages too. Well, that actually uh, doesn't end well for them, but still, we have to count on squirrels. And a, a little bit um, more uh, succinct way, which can be fit on a t-shirt, is with great power comes great responsibility. We as hackers, as engineers, as technical community, we now have great powers. And we have to take the ethical principles in mind to know how to exercise this great power with the great responsibility. And even beyond the internet, there are other technologies which some people think lead to the technological singularity. And uh, some other people ask us to consider the nature of the exponential function. So the exponential growth is by definition unsustainable. Think about it. Ursula Legvin, on the other hand, invites us again to, to consider a society which would not be focused on the growth and on the endless growth and endless progress, but it would be f um, concerned with preservation of the, the size and the wealth that we already have by going towards the modest standard of living, by conserving natural resources, by lowering our fertility rate, and by changing our politics to go towards cons consent. And trying to fit in our environment and to try to live without destroying the others, without destroying the environment, and without destroying ourselves in that process. So that can be summarized in these two pictures. Instead of having the hierarchy of, of a pyramid, 
it is a circle of life. Or, as I like to say, there is an internet of trees. There was an internet of trees before we came up with this current internet of machines. There is internet of mycelia. And if we would consider the trees and the oxygen as important as Wi-Fi, maybe we would at some point still have some oxygen, or as this other joke says, or maybe it's not that bad, and we, what if we actually do all these changes to cut down consumption, to preserve everything, and it actually wasn't necessary, and we created a better world? Well, it's worth it. So my final words are, uh, in these small letters from uh, a nuclear research scientist from his Nobel Prize acceptance uh, speech where, we call, where he calls his fellow scientists to take responsibility. Because science became very powerful in influencing lives of all the humans on the world. And these scientists were called to take responsibility for the whole of humanity. And I'm saying, the same way as the scientists are responsible for it, the engineers need to take responsibility, and hackers need to take responsibility for the humanity. But we also need to take responsibility for the rest of the life on this planet, which for me is symbolized by squirrels. Thank you. Great. There is 10 minutes left, so I would like to have a discussion or questions or anybody who wants to add something but didn't have time f to be on the stage or to do a lightning talk, you have 10 minutes. So do it on the mic or ask me questions. Thanks so much for that great talk, Fesna. That was really good and wide and deep and very <laughs> positive as well. So it's also super. Um, if you go back to the uh, slide of the pyramid of, uh, uh, of internet networks, no, internet networks and capitalism. Yes, ooh. <laughs> and uh, 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 what it says in the uh, upper left corner is that you should decentralize and break up with your ISP to build networks. Well, for that, you need autonomous systems. And isn't that exactly a thing that RIPE has loads of? So yes. how do you think RIPE could be part of that work. Okay, politically correct answer to that question uh, is RIPE is a community that governs itself through the bottom-up process. So the distribution of autonomous system numbers is based on the policies that are created by the community. Currently, that policy says, if you want autonomous system number, you ask RIPE NCC, and we give you one based on a certain criteria. If there is a need to change that policy and to make it easier to get an autonomous system number or to make that distribution decentralized or some other proposal, it is current policy development process for somebody to come up with a proposal, send it to the mailing list, it's going to be discussed, other people are going to give their input, and the final policy is going to be implemented by the RIPE NCC. If this is not the, something that RIPE NCC can decide, for example, if the policy is we want RIPE NCC to get out of the picture completely, then maybe that has to go to the next level, which is IANA ICANN, which governs how are the internet resources given to the regional ed registries. And if even that is not the right level, there is the IETF level, which decides about how is the networking done and where are these resources going and in which way. So these are three possible steps. The easiest one for this crowd is the RIPE policy development process. The next one is IANA ICANN, and then, of course, in parallel, there is also ITF. But you knew all that, so I some, so, somehow suspect that that's not what you wanted to hear, but we can have that discussion later. Does this answer your question? Okay, thanks. 
So does anybody have another question for Venya? Vesna? If not, I'll be in uh, the cha tent. Ah, thank you. Hello, thank you for uh, providing this indeed wide and deep uh, framework. Uh, I'm really uh, intrigued by the metaphors you're using in the last part on, uh, say, a miscellaneum um, a fungi network and the forest and the squirrels as sort of ethical hinge points to remind ourselves of the important questions to ask. Um, I was wondering how you balance that in say, uh, your official part, the politically correct part of um, the work you do, in which you can embody some of these values, and also there's a more radical potential, perhaps, there to think of a decentralized network that's perhaps beyond the official roles and titles we take. So I was wondering, like, for you, I mean, the, the squirrel has its emblem on your T-shirt, it's in the talk, it's there, it's, it's accompanying us everywhere as uh, uh, the ethical question, is it good for the squirrels? If not, you know, uh, does this become the ethical uh, grounding for your position? Do I understand that correctly? Yes, that's, that's a good uh, way to explain it. And the other way to say is that I'm not there yet. So I keep also reminding myself all the time and questioning, is this what I'm doing necessary? Is it enough? What else could I do? And one part of the strategy is to make this shared with other people to make it easier for myself to make the step away from the position where I am now towards some other position which I don't know even what that would be. But maybe together we can come up with a, a path forward or path sideways, where would that lead? Uh, for myself, it is very hard to think outside of the box because I am in, in the box. So this is one small attempt to, to give an alternative way of looking at technologies, at values, and to spend half of my talk on one topic and the other half. And behind the last slide, there is yet another talk, which I'm not even going to show, but if you download the slides, you can see where else can that go. And then uh, one more thing. I was, in the many references you gave, you were quite concrete about suggesting nonviolent communication as one of the openings to change. I was wondering, since we have a bit of time, could you be, perhaps give a concrete example of that, what that would mean for the people here at Shah? So for the people at Shah, the first step would be to educate themselves of what the nonviolent communication is. So read the book, go to the course, watch videos, and start implementing a different way of talking to yourself and to others, which mostly means people in your team, people in your organization, people in your family. And that is going to radically change the way how we deal with everyone. But it's a very short time. I cannot explain why is nonviolent communication so wonderful. It's just very different. It's very weird. <laughs> Thank you. Last question. Hi. Thanks for uh, mentioning empathy and things like that. I think it's uh, very much missing. B um, isn't it part of the problem of the hacker ethic that it's almost fundamentally against things like uh, mass media and social media and um, you know, the doing analytics and things like this. And nowadays it seems that you need that stuff in order to get a word out. So you sort of almost need to take the evil pill a little bit. Do you know what I mean? I, I know what you mean and I would still question that question <laughs> in a sense that if it is fundamentally against hackers' ethics to use social media as they are currently, then who was the person who, who were the people who actually developed them in the first place so i don't think it is fundamentally against it was just unquestioned and it was actually implemented in the current social media the way how the hackers ethics is because it does give access to computers and to data to us to hackers it's just that these hackers are not facebook and nsa so I don't think there is, there is a mismatch there. And how can we stop doing that? Well, we need to question our hackers' ethics and say, if I'm fundamentally against this, 
why would I use it? There are other ways to get in touch with people that you need to do things together without taking the evil pill. I'm not the one to speak. I'm on Twitter. I'm guilty as everybody else here is, or maybe more than most of you. Uh, so we need to come with the solutions together. I agree. Team uh, collaborating is super important. Thanks. So uh, our time is uh, unfortunately up. So um, if you want to talk to Vesna a little bit more, you have to follow her to the Shah uh, village. Um, give her a warm applause. Thank you, Vesna, for your talk. Thank you.